We're going on to the next subject, which is the anti-vaccination movement. It's been in the news so much that we, we cannot uh, get around it. Um, I'm going to introduce Mr. Ovidio Kovacu from Romania. He is not a medical doctor, but he is an expert in, uh, with numbers and statistics. He's also the president of the Romanian Rationalist Society, and he's been involved in the skeptical movement for 10 years now. Uh, he does a podcast, and uh, um, he's going to uh, talk about the anti-vaccination movement. Mr. Kovacu. Thank you for, um, nah, it's a bit low. So thank you for welcoming me here. Um, it's funny to me that the presentation before me was about people who want to do injections. And, <laughs> and these guys do not want that at all. <laughs> Notice the theme, yeah? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I said I would be talking about the tactics of the anti-vaccine movement because you will recognize them. Uh, and I codified them in a way, it's, it's an easy presentation to go through. Uh, but I want to clarify who's an anti-vaccine activist, because there's various um, <coughs> scenarios that you may, may encounter, and the anti-vaccine activist is a specific type of personality. So, it's not a parent that is concerned or wants to understand more about vaccines. This is a normal person. It's not a parent that expresses doubt or a fear about at vaccinating. This is again a normal person. It's not a person that opposes vaccines f due to personal belief. This is maybe a bit of a, you know, a bit of a lower number, but they exist. And it's not a person that does not want to vaccinate himself or his children. This, this is not an anti-vaccine activist. This is a person who makes a choice, and it's a valid choice. We can debate. The person who is willing to spread misinformation is the activist. And if any of the above will spread misinformation, they become an activist, at least in you know, my book. Um, the good thing about most of them is they can be discussed with, they can be educated, and once you get to the root of the root cause, they can be um, helped. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best here, but it's weird. <laughs> Um, and, but the person who's willing to spread misinformation has crossed, crossed the threshold. There's probably low chances of him being educated. So, you know, sometimes you can't do it. Um, what is the goal of anti-vaccine activists? So they normally say they want to save children from the evils of vaccines. Uh, they want to help other parents by educating them. They want to maybe insert the topic of vaccination in any discussion about health. Um, argue that the vaccines are unsafe and raise doubt. Uh, I really like this tactic, raise doubt on the principle of, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire. If people say something is bad, they're probably right, but, you know, I should just believe them on a precautionary principle, so don't, don't do that. Look into it. Um, and if possible, they want to avoid legal repercussions for their choices if they exist. And there's a small number who profit. Um, there's a, well, small number, depending on how you count it. Um, there's a group of people who profit from the others who follow them into anti-vaccine ideas, uh, and they will sell alternative treatments, alternative prophylactics. Uh, they will also sell other conspiracies. We'll get to that. So, the anti-vaccine strategy guide, I call it sick, because it's fun. Um, so it comes from subvert, influence, confront, conspiracy. They don't make sense together like that, but they make sense in the acronym. So, um, Subvert means, and I'm referring specifically a bit to small groups and online groups, which is my expertise in a way. Um, but in, in these sort of groups, the anti-vaccine activist will gain trust, will act normal, will do, say all the right things, will be sort of, um, the American term is crunchy, so leaning towards natural, saying, uh, you know, organics and all that. Uh, gain thrust, maybe authority in the group, like a, being, be a moderator if there's a, an online group or if it's a mom group that is meeting um, regularly, they'll be the go-to person to, to do things. And then they'll attack vaccines either slowly or directly and rely on the trust they gained over time to influence. 
Um, and then influence comes with influencers. So uh, you need to identify friendly voices, uh, people who will spread your message. Uh, they usually come up by, um, I mean, they're usually found in the health circles. Uh, well, sometimes they're vegetarians, vegans, uh, other times they're um, people who have a store in their shop. Uh, there's very, there's, usually there's a, there's a mix between these guys who want to sell health information uh, or go into natural uh, ideas and, and anti-vaccine messaging. Um, if you find someone who's saying, I, you know, I believe in organics and non-GMOs and all that, we can debate how that is wrong. But if they say that, but they're pro-vaccine, you know, that's, that's the group to go to. Um, and they will, the, the anti-vaccine activists will also privately message doubting parents. So my group has, I'll, I'll get to my group, but my group has parents who say, you know, should I do this vaccine? And they'll get messages saying, no, no, don't, stop, uh, don't do that. And that is effective because it's a direct message. It's like uh, Amway in a way. Um, and of course, if they get to Let's, let's say there's legislation against them, so they get to be noticed at a national level. They'll confront regulation and they'll push back and um, lobby even. They do have organizations to lobby with and exploit any weakness. And I meant that as of the politicians, right? So if you have weak politicians, they will collapse under the pressure that anti-vaccine groups will bring. They will be very noisy. They'll be... Um, a lot more present than pro-vaccine people because most people do not, you know, gather and scream for washing their hands, pro-washing hands. If someone wants to promote non-washing of hands, they'll be very vocal about it. Because, you know. um, and conspiracy. This is an easy way to get people into the discussion, so they'll push on the idea of somebody wants you dead, you know, every, how the um, world population has crumbled since the 1900s. There's so, many, so much less people now in the world. I'm being sarcastic. Um, it's all part of the plan. There's some sort of big plan, either big pharma or um, big pharma and the guys who do GMOs or some other groups are always there to have a plan. There's always a plan. That's why Brexit is going so well. Um, and um, of course, there's no smoke without fire. So. That'll, that'll help people get into it. They'll be interested if they if you say, listen, I'm not saying it's true, but people are saying this, so maybe something is true. And how well does that work? How well does, does the strategy work? Well, this is the um, ECDC, so that's the European Center for Disease Control, statistics on um, notification rates, rates of measles. And these are the countries who are most affected, so the dark red is most affected and s slowly going towards blue. Um, so this is just the EU, basically. You see most of the countries have at least a few cases. And if we're going outside of the EU and going into Ukraine, Congo, Madagascar, and the US, there's additional thousands, thousands of cases, tens of thousands of cases. So worldwide, um, we're not progressing in preventing measles specifically, mostly because it's very infectious. Um, I wanted to mention that, oddly enough, um, there is significant proof that vaccines work. And my example here is the number of vaccine doses in measles patients in my country, in Romania. Um, so the dark red is no doses, no vaccines ever. Uh, the orange is one dose, and the green is two doses. The black is unknown status. That usually means um, there's no vaccine in the background or there was a disease that, that happened, not in the case of measles, but unknown status usually is treated as a we, don't, we, we should be vaccinated. In this case, it's probably older people who don't have a record or have, um, um, are born before 1978. That's not old, but you know. Um, so um, the, the known rate of vaccine success is 97% for two doses. Now you can do the math, 93 plus the four of the one dose, that's 
97% efficiency is claimed on the leaflet, 97% is visible right there. Direct correlation, if you want, direct evidence. Um, the guys who do get measles after two doses, you know, not everything is perfect. Uh, these are the measles cases across the EU, again, uh, over the last two years. Uh, we've had a pretty standard um, uh, approach, so the, mostly the same cases every year. There's a recurrence in the spring and in the summer, and then it drops down in the winter. For the last two to three years, this has been the, the rate of, of um, measles across the, the European Union. And this is very interesting. Uh, the U.S. has reported its highest, highest measles case count in 25 years. That's one, of, one generation, 25 years. And the WHO European region, which is more than the EU, which includes Ukraine and um, Serbia and all the other countries that are not in the EU, has had more than 90,000 cases this year up to now um, than the whole of 2018. So we're doing very well in, in stopping this. Uh, it's not just anti-vaccine activists. It's not just their fault. I don't want you to go away finding the first anti-vaccine guy and say you're causing deaths and everything. I do that a lot. It's not working. Uh, <laughs> it's not just them. It is, uh, it is a multifactorial issue. The main issues are around access to vaccines. Yes, shockingly, there, is, there are still issues with that. Uh, and to providing medical services. Vaccines are this, this first step into providing proper medical services. If you can provide vaccines to a group, to a population, that means you can establish a foothold to give them medical services, long-term long medical services. You can give them uh, regular checkups. You can find uh, historical information on their diseases. You can find new, uh, new information there. And getting all the people to go to a doctor, have a doctor nearby and not worry about, I need to go through 500 kilometers to get to a doctor, that is a, a big issue. It's being worked on, of course, but it's a big issue and it's one of the causes of, of, uh, of epidemics. And I want also to cover legislation in our wonderful region. Um, so there's these scenarios of, uh, of legislation across the EU. They were analyzed by the Sabin Institute in 2018. It's a very good report. Uh, you can find it with that title. Uh, there's basically five, yes, five scenarios within the EU, which is vaccination is recommended, which means we want you to vaccinate and here's our, here are the vaccines, but if you don't do it, you know, be free. Um, it's either, then it's recommended with, with follow-up. So if you, we want you to vaccinate, but if you don't, we're gonna ask you some questions. It's not mandatory, we're not gonna you know, slap you or anything, but we're gonna ask you why, and what is your background, and why are you saying no. There's recommended with mandatory, uh, mandatory requirements for school attendance. So this is fo focusing on kids. This is the first type of consequence in, in many states um, across the EU. If you don't vaccinate at, uh, before school, that kid may have an issue going into school. Then there's mandatory, le legally speaking, mandatory immunization with monitoring and follow-up. Uh, this is categorized as, you know, we're, we're following up, but we're not great at enforcing it and making sure that everyone is caught up into the, into the follow-up. So legally, it's mandatory. Um, practically, it's not easy to enforce. And then there's the, the next step is mandatory with robust follow-up, which, in which Belgium is mentioned, by the way. But I, I think it's just for one vaccine. That's my, my, um, my memory of this thing. Uh, and more recently, France and Italy, Italy have uh, pumped up the legislation on it. <clears throat> okay, so this is the spread of legislation across, the, I think this is the WHO European region, and the way the legislation stands, the blue is recommended, the red is mandatory with robust follow-up. And you can see there's a big spread of legislation across the, the region. Um, the funny part is they all seem to work. So according to the report, no, I, I don't fully agree, but that's maybe just my bias. 
according to the report, uh, all approaches are effective to getting a reasonable amount of protection. Uh, there are no clear winners. However, the most important piece is not the legislation, but the way that the people trust the system they are being asked to join in by offering their arm up. Um, so additional, so I, I wanted to mention specifically here, because it was mentioned to me by an anti-vaxxer, Finland has a recommended legislation. Everyone is free to, to not vaccinate. However, the rate of, um, of um, vaccination is very high. And, and that's because people trust their system. And the anti-vaxxer told me, you know, I, I don't trust the system like the Finns do. I want to trust it, but I would rather, I mean, why, why can I get the same thing as in Finland? And I said, but you are getting the same thing. We're getting the same product. The problem is not with the product. The problem is with the trust. And I wanted to mention, if you are a journalist of any, in any way, um, trust is this very difficult thing that is hard to gain and easy to lose. And uh, if you're running a, a story on um, some issue in the medical system, and of course there's many issues in all medical systems, that st story you write, or the story that is being that you're seeing, the story that is, uh, let's say, is causing a big fuss, that will also affect this in a long tail, in a in a very roundabout way, maybe not easily identifiable, but. I can tell from my country people have, have growing issues with the health system and it's been growing and growing as many uh, uh, as long as there's been stories, press stories about, um, about issues within the system. So all approaches work, just it matters also where they work, how the system is set up. And of course um, our friends in the UK have gotten a parting gift. Um, this is just announced. Um, they just lost their measles free status. I think they gained it in 20, 2000 or 2012. I'm not sure of the dates, but that means there have been, there's been no measles circulation within the country nationally, for, not from visitors, um, uh, for the last two years. That, that's what, that, that gets you measles free. And then um, if, you, if you start circulating within the country again, to nationals which are there, then it's, you're, you lost it. UK is not alone in this. Uh, recently, yesterday, the story was that um, Albania, Czech Republic, I want to say uh, two other countries in Europe, I can't name them right now, and of course the US have all lost measles-free status. So we're going back, basically. I like the title of the story saying, uh, an expert said we're embarrassed. This is happening, and a public health expert. Though the UK, you know, <laughs> they kind of deserve this one, to be honest. <laughs> they should join in on the issue. Um, they, they, it started there, so it's only fair. Um, <clears throat> the role of social media is very important today. Uh, the Royal Society for Public Health has said that over 50% of parents of children under five see negative messages about vaccines on social media. And uh, of course the vaccine side effects are the most strongest message that, that the AV part, uh, people are, are putting out. Um, Anti-vaccine groups are also considered enhancers for conspiracies. Uh, if you believe that the entire world is conspiring against you to get your kid vaccinated for some reason, you're gonna believe other things, other weird things. Maybe. I mean, the first one I can think of is um, chemtrails, you know, the airplanes that leave tracks in the sky. Yeah, very, very popular um, in, in the anti-vaccine circles. Uh, there have been some social me media platforms that have taken steps. Um, I want to specifically mention Pinterest, though I'm not sure how many people use it within, within the EU. Um, Etsy has done something, they're not selling, I don't know what, detoxification things, uh, post-vaccines, and Facebook has done something, but Twitter uh, has, not, has not been proactive. The social media platforms, though, will only act when asked to do something, and they will focus on very influential pages. Uh, 
So it's it's causing this um, this um, variation. You take out the head of the hydra, but then the little heads pop up in other places. It's 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 not going to be effective if it's a whack-a-mole. It's going to be effective as a full-on policy. Pinterest has recently mentioned that they will, if you search for vaccines, you'll they'll sh pop up pins from CDC and WHO and all the good good things. So, um, question is what to do, right? Well, there's a few options. This is the first one, which is not going to work, and please don't do it. Uh, Anti-vaxxers will always engage, and they, for some reason, are always combative about it. If you, I mean, just try it out, right? Just say on your Facebook page, um, please vaccinate your kids. Just do that. No, not, not now. Just try it out. Um, it's, it's autumn, so flu is coming. You know, it's a good time. Um, you will get, at one point, if you have the right friends, because, you know, um, you'll get some people saying, no, no, why, why are you infringing on my rights to not vaccinate? You're not infringing. You're just saying, please vaccinate. It's still optional. You're just saying, you're just saying that you're pro-vaccines and supporting the idea of science. It doesn't matter. They will attack you on the fact that you're saying you're pro-vaccine. It doesn't matter how nicely you, you cushion it. Um, however, without pushback, without action, without regulation, and without engagement, they will convince people because, because, because it's the only voice that is easily heardable if everyone else shuts up. And then engagement. And uh, we had this discussion over lunch. Um, it's usually not recommended for professionals, for medical professionals, usually not recommended to engage directly on a one-to-one -one debate. And um, the standard advice is don't treat them as equals, do not, give them, do not allow the press to give equal time. Uh, they'll just, the anti-vaxxers or the, you know, the other type of conspiracy person will just get a boost from it. And of course, always know who is listening and customize your message. However, I am, moving to the opinion that we have been failing with that position of not engagement uh, because it's just creating these two bubbles. One is the anti-vaxxers who have been, let's say, uh, hidden away in society and now are getting a bigger bubble to talk into through social media. And then uh, there's the experts who have been, well, I mean, let's be honest, they've not been very outwardly <laughs> Uh, over time, and now when they try to do it, they're going to get countered with this crazy person. So, um, not not uh, not engaging s doesn't seem to work, but engaging is also tricky. So don't just do it. You know, if you're if you're a medical professional, don't do it on the on the spot and without preparation. Um, well-trained, well-prepared debates can happen, and they sometimes work, depending on the people engaged. Uh, I give you the example there of Bill Nye versus Ken Ham, which is a, you can see the, present, uh, the debate, uh, it's on creationism. And the people there are uh, in Romania, the first one is a doctor, and the second person is, a, is the face of the anti-vaccine movement in Romania. They had a 20-minute discussion uh, on TV, and after the discussion, the lady closed her Facebook page, and that's been going on for six months now. I can give you more details. It's very juicy, but it's um, it's not it's not translatable. You need to see it to believe it. Basically, it was very fun. Um, or the third option is to give them polio. <laughs> not that polio, though, uh, which is pre-parenting, omni-channel legislation, infrastructure, and outreach. I realize these are basically the same thing. After I went through them, it's all communication. Okay, uh, first one, pre-parenting is just discussing about vaccines with a parent before they have a child. If you have, you know, uh, if you have friends, if you have future nephews, if you have, um, uh, yeah, nephews, no, that's an a, a encompassing word, um, or future kids, discussing with the doctor previously to Clarify and infuse is very effective. It's actually the only proven effective method to to um, to make people vaccinate. 
And of course, education in schools and early adulthood, we do have some classes on health, so just include that and push them into people. Uh, I mentioned omnichannel because uh, it's a word that is, you know, it's a bit of a marketing thing, but it's basically having information available, making it available everywhere that people might, might be. Uh, if it's on Facebook, if it's on Instagram, if it's on, on the social medias, or if you're an old, uh, you know, if you're an old media type of person, if it's on paper, if it's on SMSs, if you want to get a call, you need the state, the system needs to be ready for your requirement and educate you on that. That is the ideal scenario, of course. Um, legislation, now my position here is that we need to harden regulation and limit the options. Um, and r legislation needs to have consequences. It doesn't need to be mandatory in all states or anything, but if you don't vaccinate, you need to have a consequence. Whatever that is, that can be left to the states, uh, but it needs to have a consequence. You're basically allowing, uh, you know, uh, diseases into society, so, you know, at least pay more for insurance or something. Of course, infrastructure is important, uh, making sure um, follow-up is done, safety and all that, and availability of uh, medical services and communication, communication, communication. Again, these are all basically communication uh, and having the infrastructure for communication ready and, of course, the actual needle. Um, so I can give you a bit of my, my group. This is my group uh, that is doing vaccine education for parents. Uh, it has 82,000 parents at this time. Uh, you know, they're go coming and going. So I, I looked at the stats and 5,000 people have left uh, since January and 11,000 have joined. So it's it, but coming and going. I'm fine with it. People get their info and get out. It's fine. Um, but we asked them, the people who were there at the time, we asked them if, due to the group, they had a conversation with their, with their GP, with their general practitioner, and they said yes, and you know, it's, a, it's a big number there, 81%, the 3,000 responses, the people who answered. Um, the decision to give optional vaccines was influenced, and this is what I wanted to show, that we have an influence on the discussion. So many of the people said that the group was highly influential, majority influence on giving optional vaccines to the, to the, to the kids. Um, I focused on optional vaccines because it's, it's easier to suss out the data to actually identify that we had a me measurable contribution than I followed the standard, uh, standard protocol. That's harder to say, was it me or was it the fact that it's a, it's a recommended vaccine? Uh, and these, we asked here what vaccine was given. So uh, MMR is because of the epidemic in Romania, we're giving it nine months as well as at 12 months. And so 765 of the vaccines would have otherwise probably been skipped. And we, being there, insisting and all that, uh, gave some, some help. Uh, Chickenpox, rotavirus, all of those were added in. And we also did some infographics to help out and explain the information. Uh, first one is measles. The other one is the order of vaccines. So how, when you can, when you can wait, and when you can, when you don't need to wait. And the last one is the actual national plan for vaccination and the many optionals, optional vaccines available. Question becomes: Why should you care? Right? You're probably vaccinated. Nobody seems sick. Um, <coughs> Vaccination is the foundation of science-based medicine. It's actually, you know, the first vaccine was done in 1796, uh, which is technically before modern science was, um, is considered as starting in the 1850s. Uh, so it is one of the pillars of science. It's one of the first steps to understanding that there's more than humors and magical thinking. Um, it's one of these foundational steps we rely on to have medicine functionally and public health in general. Uh, but if, you know, if the principle of supporting science <laughs> does not appeal to you, it's the same thing, uh, I can say it the other way, there's no safety in numbers without vaccination. If you think you're safe now because you're vaccinated or you had a disease at one point, there'll be some other disease you have not had or it wasn't a vaccine when you were a child, and 
there'll be an epidemic and you'll probably be hit. So it's either you, you, know, you help support science, there's a good thing to do, you're probably saving a life somewhere, uh, helping a parent get over their uh, fears and helping them uh, protect their child, but also you're protecting yourself. So you can be very uh, egocentric about it. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And I'm very grateful that there is some uh, uh, advice on what we can do uh, to, uh, to change uh, the, uh, things for the future. So thank you very much for that to end on a, on a positive note. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, the microphone can go to the back. No. Oh. All the way in the back, uh, Josef. Yeah. And Andras has a question. Thank you for the talk. Um, do you see the need for um, like an overall umbrella-like kind of legislation on a European level to, to tackle this? Or, or you believe or you think that it's better to keep it in the hands of the local governments, the, the different countries' governments? Because we, we see across the board, we see a large difference in the, the vaccine coverage of different countries. I'm happy to, to be from the country with the lowest number per million um, in, in the country, but, uh, but obviously it, it has a historical background that historically we've had uh, the greatest number of compulsory uh, vaccines uh, to be given to children. Yeah. So how do you see this? Uh, since I'm in Belgium, I want to mention, but you know, uh, it can be live streamed. There's a global vaccination summit at the um, uh, European Commission in 12th of September. It's happening there. This will probably be discussed. I will be there uh, as a surprise <laughs> to, to myself mostly. Uh, managed to get there. Um, so yes, I think the legislation at a EU level should be harmonized, at least in the to the level of these are the minimum mandatory vaccines every country needs to offer. Mandatory, I mean, minimum recommended. These, are, needs to be, these need to be provided to the entire population across the, uh, across the EU. Uh, and then there's also a proposal, if I know uh, the background of the, the story here, is there's a proposal of a, of a vaccine passport, let's say. So there's a lot of Romanians going to multiple countries in the EU. Uh, emigrating, and they sometimes they get their history sometimes, so medical history, but it's not a standardized method. It's not something that the doctor in the new country can fully understand. Uh, so there's a proposal of a unified passport, let's say, for vaccines that have been done a medical uh, history of vaccines. Those are the two things. My view, and I wanted to clarify my my position on the regulation. I think and. I've done some personal research, but I don't want to present it as a, you know, as a be or end all. Um, countries with mandatory vaccination tend to have higher rates of overall compliance. Of course, it matters historically, uh, but even I mean, even countries like like the ones that have recommended um, recommended vaccines, they do have good compliance, but it's not as good. Uh, like one, two, three percent difference, which is okay overall as a as a protection of the society, is just not as good as it could be, uh, and it's also the the rate in countries which are recommended for vaccination is very at risk of the stories that the anti anti vaxxers are pushing. So, like the MMR story in the UK when the the MMR Autism Connection was made, the the MMR vaccination dropped sharply and then rose back after, after some time. Um, but that same story is still causing issues and causing probably this epidemic and, and several others uh, in, in the world um, in countries where trust in the system is lower. So while the UK recovered, even though not perfectly, um, they, they recovered, they, they, they impacted everyone else which has similar legislation, but worse implementation of the system, of the health system. So 
if, if these things can go together, like strengthening the, the delivery of vaccines, then you, can ask, uh, then you can ask people to say, yes, you should be vaccinated, and there, there will be consequences if you don't. If, uh, because I've, you know, I've made investments as a state, I've made investments in, in making sure you're getting the best things and the best options possible. Yes. So Any other questions? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, in the back Sorry. first, and then, yeah, the, and then the, lady. the lady in the front. Um, I have a very skeptical question um, because of uh, there's so many models like uh, changing people's behavior. You have uh, in psychology of Eisen model of recent action. You have uh, Prochaska, and all of these models to change people's behavior are rather unsuccessful. The best programs to stop smoking only get to about 25% of effectiveness. So I'm wondering, you were presenting a lot of figures about the vaccines, but the sick, the steps, did you research them? Whether it's really those steps that those anti-vaccine people have, or your own polio approach, did you test it? Did you look at the separate ingredients, which ingredients work best, etc.? So my question is, in your approach, how much science did you use? Right, I, I, I know what you mean. And uh, I did not test the, um, let's say, the effectiveness of the group besides the, re the survey I did, uh, mostly because it's very difficult to, because of the volume of people. I do want to, um, to, let's say, separate the people, ask them what they think about vaccines before they join in, and then if the group helped in any way, I know that's the proper approach. It's, it's harder to implement in terms of um, workload for, for me and the team. Um, in terms of psychology and, and the way to change the behavior, there are experiments, I mean, there's legislation in other places that works, and we've seen it work. Uh, like Australia is the usual example of um, causing, making consequences happen. So they I think they restricted some payments, some social benefit payments for parents who do not vaccinate. Uh, and that caused the rate of vaccination to go up. Uh, and California had a similar approach in eliminating exemptions from, for non-medical um, yeah, non reasons, uh, for personal belief exemptions. And that caused the personal belief exemptions to go down, but also caused the medical exemptions to go up because they didn't regulate them. And now they're doing a different approach of regulating the, the exemptions, making sure they're being properly checked against the actual exemptions for vaccination. So um, the approach to, to making sure that um, coverage grows is very complex. It, it depends a lot on the on many, um, let's say, many personal things that people look at when they take a decision to trust the doctor in front of them. Uh, it, it takes a lot on the doctor itself, uh, himself, depends a lot on him as well. Um, but there are legis legislative approaches that do help and do work. Um, my view here is simply that there needs to be a consequence. There needs to be a consequence if you don't vaccinate. It, it just cannot be a free-for-all for this specific reason. I mean, I can be as liberal, as conservative as needed, but in, in other topics, but on this one, there's a this fine line between uh, the, your benefit and our benefit, and our benefit is worth your little inconvenience of being vaccinated. Okay, there was one question Maybe in, in the, the front. front. Yes, here. And then, uh, can I ask? Yes, thanks a lot for your speech, and it was really encouraging to see the kind of effect that you can have in the group based on your survey. So I was a little bit curious to hear what kind of tactics you have found most effective mm -hmm. when you're discussing things in the group, um, especially on the level of listening or sharing information, also on whether you should share it as a personal story or if you share infographics or these yes. kind of things. So we use basically all approaches. <clears throat> There's no, I mean, um, sometimes people say we're being too aggressive to anti-vaxxers. Well, they're not in the group officially. Um, and we sometimes say, listen, these are the anti-vaxxers. They should do that and that or get out of the country or something. <laughs> uh, not specifically. Um, 
for parents, the questions we're getting are parents who say, we're doing this vaccine, is it okay? What, what's, what sort of reactions have there been? Um, can you tell me anything about this specific vaccine? And, vaccine? And in those cases, we just provide the uh, information. We provide the uh, data we have. Uh, we have some stories written up and some scientific, um, um, let's say, layman's terms posts up as well. Uh, and we try our best to direct them in the right, right place. I do take advantage of stories as well. So there's some time, I mean, right now, because of the U.S. epidemic, there's a lot of stories coming up every day on the impact of vaccines or not vaccinating. And sometimes there, there's uh, the story of a person who was not vaccinated as a child or who has, still has polio or seen polio or has a, per, uh, a person who has suffered from a disease. And those come up as well, and I treat them, I use them as, there as well. Um, so it takes all approaches, basically. Uh, I am very gentle with parents who want to vaccinate and just need additional information. That's, you know, that's very easy to work with. Um, and, but of course, there's sometimes people who will, the, the spectrum is, you know, there's a spectrum here. Uh, at the other end is people who will just give me a list of questions which are anti-vaccine talking points and I'm supposed to debunk them for the nth time, of course. Uh, and uh, in that case, I'm not as friendly, you know, because they're not actually discussing with me or to, to, to be educated. They want to challenge. So uh, it's, a, it's a multilateral approach. I have a, a other admins as well and they, they help out as well and everyone has their own uh, system. Uh, but overall, I think we're covering all the bases. We are aggressive when we need to be aggressive because people will respond to that as well, not all, all of them, and, and very kind when we need to be very kind. That's in, in the middle, of course, there's, there's all sorts of variations. And super little extra to that. Do you think there's a difference in how you approach that in Romania than how you think that one might approach the question in some other country? Is your system, does it influence how, what needs to I think the main influence is around doctors and how they are trusted by their patients. So that's the main issue. Uh, we have to correct doctors. I have to correct doctors on a regular basis because they tell patients that the MMR vaccine should not be given due to egg allergies, which is um, a recommendation that was retracted 20 years ago. Okay, there's studies that you can quote, and it's 1996 or something. Um, and I, I have to say, listen, your doctor has not read this, has not updated his, his information for 20 years. This is not okay. Just find another one. Um, <laughs> I don't want to do it, but it's, you know. Uh, or we've yeah. had issues with, with uh, there's been a sensitive flu, uh, I mean, quite a lot of cases of flu, and deaths as well. And we were struggling with doctors to actually vaccinate children older than six months because they were saying, no, no, over three years. No, the, the actual leaflet of vaccine says six months. This is a fragile child. He's not gonna last two, three years if you don't vaccinate him now and he gets the flu. So uh, we've had multiple, multiple cases where we needed to actually help the parent push against their doctor and that is, not something I want to do, but something that, in this case, I, I need to do. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very interesting, sure. all of this. Big round of applause for our video.